this is Brian Rowe with Mythic MTG Tech number 295 talking today about Moat, Tabernacle, and Library of Alexandria along with buyouts and proxies generally. But before we go too far I just want to give a huge thanks to MTG Stocks out there. This is one of the absolute best websites out there for checking prices to see what's going on. They're not a sponsor of the channel, they're just a site that anybody who follows Magic Finance should be following. Library. Ooh. Beginning of this month, it jumped from a few hundred dollars to over a thousand dollars. This is crazy for a card that is banned in EDH and only played in Vintage. But the price may be somewhat sustainable, and I'm going to talk about that a little more. Tabernacle went way up, 1400 recently. This price seems a little high to me, but we're going to talk about how to figure out if a price is inflated or if this price is going to stay. Moat. It jumped up to over $800 for a short period of time. They disappeared off of the internet. I hear that this was related to a particular single individual buying out and then going to the finance community trying to get other people to rally around and buy them out to deal with this jump. This is a card that has a lot of nostalgia for a lot of people. It's a super powerful casual card played occasionally in EDH and in a blue moon in Legacy. It is not a multiple copy Legacy staple by any means and to see it jump like this over night this is the classic sign of a buyout that price curve that just shoots directly through the roof and then starts to come back down almost immediately as more people start to relist them next we've got nimbus maze this is an odd one i did not realize that this buyout was coming i couldn't have predicted this at all this is a modern card an edh card a beautiful card and actually a very playable card in fact all of the future site lands that we've seen over time have gained some value because they're very playable but once again we've got this price curve that is really unnatural and i'm curious to see where this settles my guess is going to be down near that low price that the 30 plus dollars is really inflated and we're going to see it down around the 15 or 20 dollar range the big problem that we've got at this point is there's a choke point on the pricing 0.1 percent of the market or even less when it comes to newer cards are listed on tcg player but everybody uses tcg player as the go-to source for prices so 70 percent of the market is using this price guide and it represents 0.1% or less of the market, which creates the situation where prices can be manipulated by outside forces very, very easily. So how do we deal with something like this? The first solution that I really want to emphasize, I've talked about this in the past, is to look at buy list prices. Anybody can post a cheesy price that is through the roof on TCG Player. And if you've got enough capital, you can buy out whatever's there and then post your inflated price and hope that nobody actually checks to see what the card is worth. A more accurate way to look at the value of cards is look at what the offers for cash are. Right now, a Pearl, which is going for $1,300 on SCG's site, has a buy list price of $700 cash. That gives you an 85% markup. If you use that same logic to apply it to Library of Alexandria, Library of Alexandria should be about a $900 card, not a $1,200, $1,300. The offers to buy are concrete. I would suggest looking at a little bit more reasonable margin. 40% is a very solid margin for pretty much any business out there. 85%, you're paying somewhat for the reputation and the instant delivery that you get out of places like Star City Games or Card Kingdom. Anything over that 85% starts to look really circumspect, like the price is overly inflated and artificial. It's very difficult, unfortunately, though, to scrape these buy list now. I know somebody who created an application to scrape a buy list and then went to GPs, picked up a bunch of cards, and then uh, sold them back because they were buying them slightly under the buy list prices. SCG has specifically made it really difficult to query and scrape their buy list. Some of the other buy lists are a little bit easier to get to. Buy lists are the go-to place to figure out what the price actually is. Buy lists do have some disadvantages though. They do tend to increase at a slower pace, so you can be caught a little bit behind 
behind a trend, but you're not going to buy something that is overinflated if you're looking at buy list prices. Let's look at the four different cards that were mentioned earlier and the current buy list prices at two major sites, which is Star City Games and Card Kingdom. In each of these cases, we are seeing that the price has moved up on the buy list, but they don't necessarily justify the full price that we're looking at that is showing up on TCG Player. On the Card Kingdom ones, the first one is the cash and the second one is the a credit amount there. Your first red one is really what you want to be looking at. Generally here, these buy list prices show that the value of these cards is going up, but not as much as we're seeing out of TCG Player. Now the second thing is Wizards has some leniency in their reprint policy to reprint special purpose reprints. This hasn't been used for a long time. It was back with the World Championship decks that we saw these gold border cards. I was a huge fan of these. I would love to see Wizards annually take maybe a vintage or a legacy deck from Eternal Weekend and print something like this. Make it 100% clear that these are not tournament legal. I might even put somewhere on the front that not tournament legal as a way for people to get some high quality proxies that are not intended for tournament use. The more realistic solution that I see though comes with a recent statement regarding the proxy uh, policy or the way that Wizards is enforcing their intellectual property rights here. Now this comes from a recent article. I will post a link to the article in the about section, but the most important part is that last sentence. And there's a huge misconception in the community that Wizards of the Coast is dealing in this old school draconian way, and they're not. They have updated their policies to be much more lenient around non-commercial proxies. Wizards of the Coast has no desire to police playtest cards made for personal, non-commercial use even if that takes place in a store. This is a new policy from Wizards. It is not fully understood by most people, and it really allows for non-commercial, not-for-resale proxies to be used in a casual league or in some type of a non-commercial environment. If you want to get together and proxy up some vintage decks and clash them against your friends, either at home, at a bar, or at a local game store, this policy specifically allows it. I'm gonna do a video on the difference between counterfeits and proxies. They are significantly different and often confused. One of the best practices that I just wanna put out here is list directly on the card that it is not for sale, that it is a proxy so that there's no consumer confusion so nobody could get duped. The last thing we want is somebody spending hundreds of dollars on a card that is not an official card. These should be traded at the cost that it is to make them. They should not be a profit generator. They should just be a way for people to get familiar with those older cards to play them and to understand some of the history of Magic the Gathering. To dive in and study more about Magic the Gathering, subscribe to the channel. To help me produce more content, please become a patron. For $1, I thank you, and you get access to some of the slides early. For $2 a month, I will do a one-time pack opening for you on the channel, and for $5, your name gets added to the credits. On deck for pack openings are Simon and Brandon. If you want to be on this list, become a patron in the next few days. The next pack openings are on July 8th. Thank you to everybody who supports the channel, and until next time, choose the cards wisely.